It's August 10th, 2021. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, and, and please ask the city clerk to call roll. Commissioner Galt. Present. Commissioner Guess. Commissioner Henderson. Present. Commissioner Wilson. Present. Mayor Bray. Present. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Henderson to do the invocation. Here. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how... Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, you are wonderful and you're mighty. You're a great God. You're greatly to be praised. Again, Father, we come into your presence and we thank you for the privilege of being in this place. We thank you, God, for the privilege of serving. And we pray now that you would be in the midst of every decision that we make, everything that we say and everything that we do, God, we pray uh, that it will be glorifying to you and that it will ultimately build our city. Father, we pray for each of us as commissioners. We pray for our, our mayor. We pray for our new city manager. We pray for the city of Paducah. We pray for the employees of the city of Paducah. Whatever we're standing in the need of, God, we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 To the Pledge of Allegiance. To the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, before we get started, just uh, want to welcome our new city manager, Thank you. Uh, Darren Jordan. This is his first meeting. Uh, he hasn't breathed into the microphone yet, and uh, so we'll um, we'll get him kick him off. And uh, city manager, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Mayor, none this evening. Okay, great. All right, we have some new employee introductions tonight. Um, Who's uh, who's on first? Who's in charge? <laughs> We've got a well, finance revenue technician. We'll go. Okay. okay. I'm not sure who's in charge, but we'll take care of this. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Mayor. Good evening, John. <laughs> huh? I said good, good evening. evening. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Angela Angie Stanfield, and Angie's she just started just a few weeks ago. <clears throat> You should see her smiling face at our counter as our newest revenue technician in the finance department. Angie is a graduate of Illinois Eastern College. She's calm, she's smart, she's positive, and she's eager to learn. And we're glad to have Angie on board. That's awesome. Welcome. Would you like to, would you like to say anything? Hi. Put you on the spot? I'm just excited to be here and to meet everyone. It's been so friendly and just been very welcoming. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's very nice to have you. You're uh, you're working in a uh, in a department that uh, is really at the top of their game. So you've got uh, you got you got big shoes to fill there. So <laughs> welcome aboard. Thank you so much. So human resources, um, Stephanie. <coughs> Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager. I would like to present to you the city's new Human Resources Generalist, Mackenzie Husky. Mackenzie is a graduate of Western, Uni Western Kentucky <laughs> University where she majored in Communication Studies and minored in Business Administration and Marketing. She began her HR career with Pilgrim's Pride in Mayfield as an HR Employment Coordinator focusing on recruitment and retention efforts for them. In the short time that McKenzie has been with the city, she has already represented the city at the local career fair, created a new new hire orientation manual, and jumped right into the HR software changes. McKenzie was born and raised in Paducah and looks forward to growing her professional career here at home. Please allow me to introduce to you McKenzie Husky. Welcome. Hey McKenzie, welcome. <laughs> Usually they shake hands, but I think we'll pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. Uh, 911. Uh. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioner, City Manager. Uh, we're one short today due to uh, a sickness, 
So um, we were had uh, we had four that we we're going to introduce today, but we're just introducing three tonight. We'll bring the other one in uh, once he gets uh, out of quarantine. Okay. Uh, first, we'll uh, introduce Emily Jones. Emily was born and raised here in Western Kentucky. She um, is a Paducah Timlin graduate. She's currently enrolled at Murray State University. Her father is in law enforcement. Her mom's a teacher. Her brother's in the Marine Corps, so there's no surprise that she chose public service as a, a career path right now. So uh, we're excited to have her. She's been on board for four months. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, next up, we have Bryce Mansfield. Um, Bryce may look familiar to you as he's been uh, on TV quite a lot in this community. Um, but now he's he belongs to us and he works for us. <laughs> <laughs> he switched over to the other side, right? <laughs> uh, Bryce is a University of Louisville graduate. Obviously, you guys recognize him from working for WPSD for several years. He switched over to CFSB, but his desire for public service uh, runs pretty deep in him, and, and so he decided to come work as a telecommunicator for us. He's also a volunteer firefighter for uh, Concord. So, thank you, Bryce. Thanks. Next we have up is uh, Cecilia Titsworth. She moved to Paducah a few years ago, back in 2016. She's originally from Memphis. <clears throat> she worked for probation and parole for several years, and we recruited her from there. And uh, she didn't have a long walk because probation and parole sits right there by the number one. Her commute really didn't change. Uh, but she's also going to school at uh, West Kentucky University majoring in criminology. So um, that's three of the four that we had for you. And we'll get the next one here, uh, hopefully at the next commission meeting. That's great. Thanks. Uh, Welcome. You guys were saying it. You don't have to. You don't have to. Oh, okay. <laughs> he said no. I bet Bryce would say something. <laughs> put on his man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're good. <laughs> we, we welcome can aboard. Hear his voice all the time on the radio. Now. Yeah, right. welcome aboard. It's great right. to have you. And uh, 911 is uh, obviously very important to to uh, all the community. So thank you. Okay, before we get into the agenda items, I'm just going to mention uh, that we are. Um, uh, the county came out with a, a, a policy yesterday, a mask policy, um, and um, the city uh, uh, reflected upon that uh, today. And um, I'm going to be signing an order uh, this evening uh, that declares that uh, anyone, uh, either vaccinated or unvaccinated, uh, will need to wear a mask uh, inside City Hall until you get to your desk. And that's slightly different from the county. Um, uh, they decided to differentiate uh, a bit between vaccinated and unvaccinated. We talked about that, kicked it around a lot this afternoon. Um, I think it's really hard to police uh, the people that are vaccinated and unvaccinated and checking cards. And I mean, it's it would be a nightmare. So um, uh, we all hate the. Uh, the position that we're in right now uh, with with the with the virus, uh, it's really spiked up. Um, you know, I get a report every day from the health department, and probably six weeks ago, maybe even maybe even only a month ago, I would get the report, and there was no infections in uh, in any any of the counties uh, surrounding us. Uh, but and maybe just a few in McCracken County, uh, but uh, it has swelled in the in recent weeks uh, to where we're getting uh, 25, 30 new ones every day uh, or more. And the average age, uh, no surprise, because the majority of uh, population 65 and older are have been vaccinated, uh, but the average age uh, is. Uh, I would say, uh, I looked at it one day, it's in the 30s. And so it's really changed a lot. So I hope we don't have to do this long, uh, but um, I, will be, I will be signing this this evening. And with that, uh, I guess I would ask Bruce Wilcox uh, to come up and, and give uh, the board a, a, an update on economic development. Thank you, Mayor Bray, Commissioners, Mr. Jordan, Ms. Parrish. On behalf of GPED staff and the GPED Board of Directors, we thank you for the opportunity 
to present to you this evening. In spite of the COVID restrictions that have been in place this year, GPED's been very successful and we've been winning. So we're proud of the things that we've been able to accomplish this year. During this year, we've been able to announce four projects resulting in $79 million of capital investment into our community coupled with over 100 jobs. Utilizing our partnership with Murray State University and their M-Plan software, it's an economic modeling software, we know that these 100 direct jobs create an induced and indirect additional 137 jobs, so bringing the total job impact to 237 jobs. These jobs have a recurring economic impact on our community of over $33 million a year. The projects have been the new building out at the Commerce Park, the FBI, the ATF, the DEA <coughs> offices and personnel uh, that's currently in being constructed. We announced Blockware Mining. That was a $50 million uh, capital investment project out in Industrial Park West, a cryptocurrency project. Millworks Products was a $2 million expansion of a local industrial manufacturer. And then uh, Drake Lighting, which is a distributor of tower lighting. Most recently, last week, I think most all of you saw or heard the announcement of Drake with their purchase of the vacated ACBL building out at the Commerce Park. Drake will be employing 60 individuals out there, investing $2 million into the existing building and constructing a new 5,000 square foot warehouse and distribution facility in the coming months. And it's anticipated that Drake will have an estimated impact on the economy of $6.8 million per year. Be looking for more announcements to come. Uh, we've got a lot of good things uh, brewing right now, and we've got a few things that are teed up and ready to be announced in the very near future. Our success in landing these projects has also generated an additional need or a corresponding confidence with our utility partners. Paducah Water will be constructing a new one million gallon water tank out at Industrial Park West. This has been on our books for some time, but this is a $6 million investment into Industrial Park West. Big Rivers Electric and Jackson Purchase Energy, they're investing $13 million into Industrial Park West to bring the, utility, the uh, electrical megawatt capacity up to 100 megawatts. And then Joint Sewer Agency is already in the engineering and the design work for taking sewers out to the triple rail site. So all in all, these <coughs> utility infrastructures represent an additional $20 million into our local economy or community to better position us for economic development. Additionally, on behalf uh, of the IDA, we've sold acreage uh, at retail at market value, generating $135,000 of revenue for the IDA. That money will be used to uh, further development properties for future economic development purposes. And that represents the first time in almost 20 years that we've sold land at market value in, in Industrial Park West. So we're proud of that accomplishment. And you might be interested to know that we recent re recently received the county's TVA in lieu of tax money, the 164000 I know that's been a talk of, topic of interest here, but uh, that came through DLG, and we've gotten that. So hopefully that'll put that issue to rest and we can move forward there. All in all, to put the icing on the cake, GPED's been a, pro uh, a part of over the past 12 to 14 months of bringing in right at $5 million for our community. So we're really proud of that and been proud that we've been able to generate additional cash flow and cash back to the city, to the county, to the IDA. I've got a short presentation for you here. I've got a lot more for you in closed session where I'll share uh, the good stuff with you on the projects that we have going, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have right now. How many, how many jobs came with uh, FBI, DEA, ATF, do you know? It's undisclosed. <laughs> we called that Project James Bond. <laughs> we, uh, we know what the capital investment is, and um, they never would share the, uh, the personnel count. I did meet one of the people. Uh, I think that I was actually it's maybe running the office uh, that, that had moved here early on. You know, it's a project got going, but yeah. I just there's a there's a private company actually constructing the building, and then they'll be leasing it back to the government. So good questions, stuff. we all good? Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate your support. Thank you, Bruce. 
Okay, we'll move to the consent agenda. Items uh, on the consent agenda are considered to be routine uh, by the board and will be enacted by one motion and one vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Uh, the city clerk will read the items recommended for approval. Would any commissioner like any item removed for separate separate discussion? No. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the city clerk to read the items recommended for approval. Approved minutes for the July 27, 2021 Paducah Board of Commissioners meeting. Receive and file documents, personnel actions, a municipal order authorizing and directing the mayor to execute a contract with Paxton Park Golf Board, DBA Paxton Park Municipal Golf Course, in an amount of $85,000 for specific services and authorizing the finance director to transfer funds to said board. So moved. Second. Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, we'll move to municipal orders. Um, and I guess I would ask the city clerk uh, to read the first municipal order. A proposed. Uh, sorry, no. I was just, th this is uh, really a big, uh, 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 a very large initiative for us. Um, and it has to do with the combination of West McCracken a water district along uh, with Paducah Water, and so we'll talk about it after she reads the motion, but go ahead. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled, a municipal order approving and authorizing Paducah Water Works merging with the West McCracken County Water District. So moved. Second. Bruce. <laughs> All right, good evening again. On behalf of Greater Paducah Economic Development, West McCracken Water District, Paducah Water, McCracken County, and the City of Paducah, I'm pleased to present this evening's <coughs> municipal order requesting approval and authorization of the merger between Paducah Water Works and the West McCracken County Water District. GPAD's mission is to proactively re recruit companies to our community and support those already here. Within our mission, we strive to better position our community for future economic growth. Having solid utility infrastructure with competitive rates is a necessity. Ms. Parrish, if we could go to the service territory slide. There we go. It's no secret that we believe our best large-scale economic development opportunity is at our triple rail site in West Paducah. From this slide, you can see that the water service to the west of Paducah is fragmented. The blue portion there represents the service area of Paducah Water. The yellow area represents areas served by West McCracken Water District, and the pink area is what we consider the triple rail site. <clears throat> Earlier this year, we were responding to a, an RFI, a request for information, on a project that required 80 million gallons of water a month. It was a very large, extremely large consumer of water. Heather Pierce, our project manager and Paducah Water Board member, recognized an opportunity knowing that Mc West McCracken Water Board supply of water came through Paducah Water and the West McCracken water weights were higher. So she saw an opportunity to address an issue in attracting prospective large-scale <coughs> customers. As it turns out, it was a big win for most all of the West McCracken residents. Heather, acting as a catalyst to see if there was an additional interest, reached out to McCracken County Judge Executive Craig Clymer, along with then Paducah Water Manager Bill Robertson. Through Judge Clymer's discussions with West McCracken Water District Chair Benny Hetty and their Board of Directors, it was apparent this would be a big win for the residents of West McCracken County, existing businesses, schools, and economic development. Now, Ms. Parrish, if we could go to the right slide. We applaud the leadership of West McCracken County Water Board Chair Hetty and their Board of Directors, along with the collaborative partnership with Judge Clymer and the Paducah Water Team. Overall, most of the 1,500 West McCracken County customers will see on average a rate decrease of 20% to 50% in their water bills. An average family of four 
consuming four to 5,000 gallons of water per month should see about a 30 to 33% decrease in their monthly bill. Paducah Water uses a declining block rate structure, which means the more water you consume, the lower the cost of the water. This is a tremendous win for our West McCracken schools, large industrial consumers, and future large scale development projects. Large scale consumers, as you can see, consuming over a million gallons per month should see a 50% decrease in their monthly bills. Existing water, uh, Paducah Water customers, they will not see any change in their water bills or their rates. So again, we applaud the efforts of Heather Pierce, Judge Clymer, the West McCracken County Water Board, and the Paducah Water Board, and you, Mayor Bray. Uh, Commissioner Guest isn't here this evening, but Commissioner Guest is the uh, City Commission representative on the Paducah Water Board, and we applaud his support as well. Before we formally ask for your uh, motion to approve the ordinance, uh, Leader, um, Commissioner, Ch uh, Board Chair Hetty, he'd like to address the commission and make a few comments as well. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Wilcock. I want to thank the good Lord uh, for giving me an opportunity and uh, a mind to serve. I've served on the West McCracken County Water Board for uh, 19 years now, uh, ranging from uh, treasurer, secretary, and now chairman of that board. Uh, we, we the, the commission of uh, West McCracken, we uh, went through with, with uh, 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 Baduca Water and seeing the the uh, difference in rates and so forth and what this would do and we all made a mind up that we would not stand up the way uh, stand in the way of economic development for Baduca McCracken County so it is a pleasure for us to be able to uh, join together and merge with Baduca water uh, was it an easy thing no it was not an easy thing uh, our district consists of uh, 1500 customers plus uh, we do that with three employees. We have a uh, revenue of uh, income of about a million dollars a year, and uh, 300000 of that a year is paid back to Baduca Water for the purchase of uh, safe, clean water that uh, they uh, uh, provide us with. So I want to say thank you, uh, starting out with Bill Robinson, who uh, started this, who I, I went to and started this thing going. Of course, Bill retired and Jason took it over. But I want to say, uh, and for this board, I want to say that uh, this has been a most pleasant transition that you could even imagine. They have really made this easy, and we, we want to thank Paducah Water. We want to thank the Paducah Water Board. We want to thank everyone that's involved in this. No, was it easy uh, uh, decisions? No, and nothing good is easy. So, uh, yes, <coughs> I lost nights of sleep. Uh, thought about this, but when it all boiled down to it, we realized that it was time uh, that we uh, do something more to even make our water district greater. So I want to say to each and every one involved, thank you. I want to say to this uh, commission, Thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to speak. Uh, I remember uh, back in 1965 and 66 when the water district was formed and I was about 11 year old and I run behind the plumbers and uh, laborers that put that water line in playing on the dirt. <laughs> never, never, never in my wildest dream that I think that I would become chairman of the board <laughs> of this water district. So to the people of West McCracken, thank you for allowing me to be your chairman, to, to uh, head your water district. I hope that we have done a great job. The reason why we are doing this is because we want West McCracken water to remain great, remain strong, and this is why that we make these tough decisions. But in the long run, we want to see that our younger people will see that we're glad what they've done. So again, I want to say thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Any comments from uh, 
Questions from commissioners? It's a great thing. It is a great thing, and uh, it's it's a step forward uh, for for the community. And Benny, uh, the the community owes you uh, thanks for your leadership over the years. The entire community does, and uh, we appreciate. I applaud you and and the board uh, for looking forward uh, to see what's best for the community. Uh, we uh, that's. That's what we're all looking for is trying to do a lot more of that, thinking all of, thinking about our community as a whole instead of individually. So with that, City Clerk, would you like to call roll? Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, the next item um, uh, is... Uh, the MOU relative to the uh, Sports Tourism Commission. I bet nobody's ever heard about that. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the things, we're going to make a quick change. I, I think we have, uh, we have at least one comment, and we're going to move the comment uh, for this before we actually take our vote so we give this person a chance to talk. Um, but uh, first of all, would you like to uh, call, um, I'm sorry, read the uh, read the, the municipal order. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled <coughs> a Municipal Order of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, authorizing and approving a memorandum of understanding with the County of McCracken and the McCracken County Sports Tourism Commission regarding funding of the Paducah McCracken County Athletic Complex and authorizing the execution of all documents related to same. So moved. Second. Ms. Tracy, would you like to Make your comments. Welcome, new city manager. Thank you. Thank you, honorable mayor and commissioners. It's great. It's very nice to see you tonight. Um, I have Basically, two um, types of comments I'd like to make regarding this MOU, um, and I'd like to precede that with the statement of the athletic complex proposal and project is a good project, and Paducah needs and deserves that. Um, my comments are related to um, uh, doing it a fiscally responsible way and having a project that everyone can be proud of, not just now, but in the future. Um, regarding the finances and this memorandum of under, understanding, and um, forgive me, I've only had like a day to, to go through this, but the way I understand it is um, we have bond money for uh, 17 and a half million, or no, 12 and a half million from the county and the city. And it acknowledges in the MOU that there's an unfunded 17 million, 17 and a half million dollars that's going to have to be um, come about in some way unless the project scope is greatly reduced. Um, uh, I believe it's uh, not prudent to go forward with a memorandum of understanding. Um, and I understand that's, that's not the final agreement, but it is your, the MOU for the final agreement. Um, to have that big of a, of a deficit unanswered um, and unallocated in terms of how we're going to pay for it. It, it does go into the, um, the tourist room tax. However, we, we all know that the first year, year or two of any project, you rarely receive um, the monies that you think you will receive. Um, other athletic field complexes across the United States have operated um, the first few years at a deficit usually. Um, some come out and aren't at a deficit and others, others still remain in a deficit. And then the final point is the fact that um, the design of the project, which was done in February, had the fact that it has, in my opinion, next to no uh, public comment and review and discussion. 
no, tra no transparency, if you will. Uh, a couple years ago, we, sp we had numerous stakeholder meetings for when the city was trying to get money from the state in terms of the TIF project. This project, we're spending millions of dollars and there is virtually no public input forums for neighborhoods and common folk. You may have your um, uh, vested interest having um, provided uh, comments and receiving detailed plans, but the populace as a whole um, has had very little formal ways to provide that input. And as a Paducan, I believe I'm paying twice on this project, so I think I should have at least one good say-so. And Thank that's you. my comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comments. So let's discuss um, any uh, anything that people want to want to talk about. Um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, insight. Um, you know, the the judge and I uh, have been in discussions uh, about. Uh, you know about the sports complex for you know for some time uh, trying to work through I think it's it's pretty much public knowledge that uh, <clears throat> they came the county came to us uh, uh, some months ago and asked us to to go into a partnership with them and uh, and part of that agreement was um, asking the county to go in partnership with us on on an aging 911 system, uh, which I think that, you know, we'll be voting on that MOU here in just a moment as well. Um, I believe we were successful in that, um, in that, in that right. Um, but it also has been uh, a concern of mine to make sure that we were going about it, uh, to Miss Tracy's comments, uh, in a fiscally responsible manner. Um, and so, uh, you know, we are utilizing uh, $12.5 million of our bond money, uh, and then uh, there is an estimated uh, $42 million for the project. Uh, so that leaves, um, uh, when you throw in our 12 and a half, the county's 12 and a half, that leaves 17 and a half uh, extra. Um, we did take a hard look at the, um, uh, at the sports tourism tax or the the room tax, the county room tax, if you will. Um, COVID made a big, uh, big impact on that negatively. Uh, but the last few months, it's come back. It's come back a lot. It's been very robust. Um, and <clears throat> we believe uh, that um, that the, the traffic, the hotel traffic that will be generated uh, by this new complex will uh, will be a, um, a a real shot in the arm uh, to help increase uh, the room tax, and 80% of that room tax uh, that's collected uh, will in fact uh, go toward debt service. So there's a gap uh, beyond that, uh, based upon current estimates. Uh, you know, in year one, under the circumstances we're in now, it wouldn't cover it 100%. So you know, the city and the county are gonna to have to chip in uh, to, get it, to get it started. Um, but also, when you point out, uh, and thank you, you know, that some facilities operate at a profit and some, and some don't. And uh, I have to give kudos to our, our, our sports commission. Uh, they've been working really hard on this project. They're already, uh, they're already talking with uh, people that are gonna help manage uh, the project once it gets up and going. And one of the things that they're already talking about at this point is starting to plan uh, for when teams uh, can come in and use our facilities 12, 18, 24 months in advance. One of the mistakes that uh, the sports complexes have made in the past is they've waited too late to start planning. And so the first year, you know, there's the deficit's even larger because they haven't planned. So I don't think there's, I don't think there's 
there's no guarantees in life, uh, and certainly there's risk with this project. Uh, I'd be the first to first to admit, but you know, relative to to public comment or relative to comments from, I guess you'd say the community. I don't believe I've ever been involved with a project that had any more vocal support. Uh, you know, from uh, maybe not every single person in the community, but I, it's been, to me, it's been overwhelming, uh, the support. And so there's been a lot of, um, a lot of initiative uh, on the part of the city uh, to become a, a full partner with the county. And uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of work, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of time has gone into this. And I'm certain that the MLU is not perfect. I'm certain that there's, uh, you know, there be have to be things that will be have to be cleaned up and I's dotted and T's crossed when we get to the interlocal agreement, which will really be the document, you know, that will that will move us forward. But um, I feel good about the place that we're in right now. I feel positive about the opportunity that that we have to bring this project uh, to Paducah and McCracken County. Um, and um, and increase uh, significantly the sports uh, the the sports tourism that's going to come to this town. So those would be some of my comments. I'm happy to uh, listen to anyone else have comments. Good. I'm good with this. Um, I think that there once this is signed, there will be more time for final design. And so there will be opportunity for more input. I believe that that, that will be now that they can uh, work on the final design. Also, I'm more pleased with the funding than when we first were approached asking for 20 million or more, and there was no inclusion of the funding from the Sports Commission. So I think we've come a long way in including everybody and in to me, the original intent of the MOU on the Sports Commission uh, to form that so that there would be money set aside for projects like this. So we've come a long way. I know you've spent a lot of time on it. So thank you for your efforts. And I want us to just sign the agreement. You, we were at an agree, uh, a signing yesterday between WKCTC and Murray State on an articulation agreement for them. And I looked at the mayor and said, let's do this soon with the county uh, to get this going. I don't want us to delay any more because then we just would miss another season. So let's get going. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I um, caught the mayor before the meeting to talk to him a little bit about the... And she was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I was nice. <laughs> I tried to, to gently say, but I had a lot of questions about the 911 um, agreement and, and the timing between the two, because it's important for us to be fiscally responsible. One is a need. The other, in, in my opinion, is a want. Now, we need it for economic development. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But from my perspective, 911 is certainly a need. The sports complex is a want in, a, in our grand scheme of things. So for me, it's important to make sure that we have the need of the system that we currently own met and then can contribute. So the timing of those two things, and I had several questions about that MOU, but he, as he um, uh, assured me, the interlocal's coming, and that'll be the time to dot the I's and cross the T's. And then, then I got much nicer, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and then and Commissioner Galt you know, brings up a really good point. I mean, these, the, these projects are not co-timed. I mean, you know, so there's really uncertainty about, mm -hmm. you know, when we'll get, uh, we'll get to the 911. I mean, I'm hoping that we get the study back uh, by the end of this month. I'm ever all indications are that we will. Uh, and the MO, MOU, which we'll read in just a moment, establishes, you know, the five-person board, uh, you know, to get get us going, take us forward. So, you know, we've got we've got work to do uh, on both sides, on both sides. But. And, and, Mayor, to be fair, all kidding aside, I know how hard you have worked on this, and this has been something that you have spent day and night on, on both of these MOUs, and, and we appreciate that. We, I know that you view that as your job, but at the same time, I, it, it makes a difference when someone takes it as personally as you have and dug in, and it makes a difference. So thank you. Thank you. And 
I'm just going to say there have been a lot of great projects in our community that a lot of people have been involved with. Um, you know, the Carson <coughs> Center, 40 million plus project, the um, Expo Center, when we had to build that to expand the convention center, those were mentioned. Those have all been great projects that were game changers at the time for our community. And I think this is a great project that will be a game changer for us in the future. I, I agree, and hopefully it's uh, the first of many uh, $40 million plus projects, put it that way. I think we have a couple coming up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, without uh, further ado, uh, City Clerk, call roll. Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, uh, City Clerk, would you um, uh, read the MOU, um, I'm sorry, the, the next uh, uh, municipal order on the 911? A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt a municipal order entitled A Municipal Order of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, authorizing and approving a memorandum of understanding with the County of McCracken regarding E911 partnership formation and authorizing the execution of all documents related to same. So moved. Second. Okay, I'll just make a couple comments on this one. Um, and Commissioner Galt and I did talk before the meeting. I mean, this is um, uh, this this MOU does not have as much detail uh, around it, um, and it's um, and it's certainly a, a, memoram, a memorandum of understanding is aspirational anyway. Uh, each of these MOUs are aspirational. Um, but but this one in particular still has some uncertainty around it because we don't have the study, we don't know what the cost is going to be, uh, we don't have the latest estimate of cost, uh, we haven't really uh, gotten into looking at new uh, possibility of new funding sources. So there's uh, there's a lot of uh, meat on the bone, as they say, uh, on this particular one. But this was an excellent accomplishment. Uh, by all of us and uh, in particular for the county to come in with us as as full partners uh, on this on this project so uh, it was um, uh, it was the way that they uh, the path forward that they <clears throat> uh, that they showed us that they would they would commit uh, and we're appreciative of, of their support um, so did you have any particular comments you want to bring up now no, no, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, timing and hammering out the details, those are the two. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. Would you please call roll? Commissioner Gold? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay. Um, we have uh, some ordinances to adopt uh, for tonight, and um, uh, the, this is the second. These are second readings, and the first one is a zoning uh, text amendment um, for new land uses. So, City Clerk, would you read it? A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt an ordinance entitled an ordinance amending Chapter 126 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance amends Chapter 126 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah, Kentucky to define and permit cottage homes with certain requirements. These types of homes could be a minimum of 140 square feet and would be permitted in the B1 convenience and service zone and higher intensity zones. Manufactured homes, mobile homes, campers, recreational vehicles, storage buildings, shipping containers and or sheds are not considered to be cottage homes. Further, this amendment defines and allows short-term rentals and special event short-term rentals, which are rented less than 30 consecutive days in certain zones. This amendment also allows for the construction of a single family home on a smaller building lot than 8,000 square feet, provided setbacks are met and the floor to area ratio is not less than 10%. Allows the outdoor sale of food items, vegetables, fruits, and garden implements. Allows multifamily structure density to be determined by the Kentucky Building Code in the B1 convenience and service zone and higher intensity zones. Allows seasonal fireworks tents in the B3 general business zone and higher intensity zones. And allows only commercial uses in the front two-thirds of the ground floor of buildings in the H1 historic commercial zone. So moved. Second. 
Okay, we um, we talked about this last week, uh, or, um, two weeks ago. Want to make sure there's no. I didn't. I didn't get any feedback uh, on this one particularly. Uh, if anybody else did. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, Commissioner Henderson had asked for a tutorial on it last at the meeting last two weeks ago, and um, I appreciate him letting me join in with him uh, yesterday for a full session about this and some others. So, um, great job to the planning department on updating us a little bit more about it. So, yeah, I think I think there might be some opportunity for more housing in some way, and people just be creative and work with us. We might be able to to do that. So. It was it was good time. I, I understood it all alone. I just wanted to make sure that Josh knew what he was talking about. So, so. <laughs> but no, it is a uh, great opportunity. Well, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was it was it was good good a good tutorial, and uh, I'm ready to move forward with it. a good picture of what. We now, now, yesterday I asked him to bring a picture of what it yeah. might be, but that's okay. <laughs> we didn't. We looked at them online yesterday, even uh, for some I some of those homes. There's so. some back here, I think. Is if there you go in back here? Oh, okay. okay. It's okay. not on us. It's screen. Kind of okay. Yeah, the very back of. Very mm -hmm. back. Yeah, of what's oh, okay. not allowed and what is allowed. Right. So yeah. there are some okay, some specific it. requirements that I think could be some really nice uh, mm -hmm. opportunities, some really cool things that might happen. Thank you for these. Thank you. Okay, City Clerk, would you call roll? Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, so the next one's a text amendment uh, on mobile uh, food vehicles. <laughs> I did get some feedback on this today, so uh, <laughs> please uh, read it if you wouldn't. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt an ordinance entitled an ordinance amending Chapter 126 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah related to mobile food vehicles. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance amends Section 126-87 mobile food vehicles of the Paducah Code of Ordinances to define food tents in accordance with the Kentucky Building Code, allow them as an exemption in the Highway Business District, and provide specific guidance for food for the regulation of food tents in the B2 Downtown Business Zone and in higher intensity zones. This amendment allows mobile food vehicles to operate closer than 100 feet to a brick and mortar restaurant with the specific written consent of said restaurant and removes the 14 day time period in which mobile food vehicles must move. Further mobile food vehicles are proposed to be located on Broadway between Water Street and North 7th Street, Clarence Gaines Street, 2nd Street within 100 but of a residence if a generator is use, utilized that is 72 decibels or less. So moved. Second. Okay, I'll, I'll kick off here. Um, I, got, I got a call from a downtown resident um, and just, just uh, asking, uh, expressing some concern about what would be the circumstances uh, specifically on Broadway, if uh, if you had a lot of food trucks down there, what would be the circumstances under which uh, a lot of food trucks might be down there? What would be allowed? What wouldn't be allowed? And um, so there was an ensuing. I, I got with Josh. Um, I agree with you all. He knows his stuff, <laughs> and um, he um, uh, he gave me a good. Uh, a good overview of the project and we kind of walked through uh, the scenarios of what might or might not happen. Um, you know, and I think what you're really trying to do here is balance <clears throat> the fact that you've got people, uh, got residents living downtown and we want more of that. In the long run, we want more people living downtown. Uh, but at the same time, people want to come downtown to celebrate, and we got the new um, uh, uh, EDC, and in um, one of these days, COVID, we're going to come out of COVID, and uh, and things are going to be more back to normal, and and those things at times can clash, uh, or let's say you know just rub uh, rub up against each other. So we have to figure out a way to uh, you know to work through that. But at the end of the day. In my conversation, uh, they were okay with moving forward under our current circumstances. They just wanted to understand more about what the circumstances would be and how that would. Uh... So, Josh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about our conversation. Sure. 
Um, I, the first thing I'd like to point out is the Paducah Planning Commission did meet on July 8th, and they are forwarding a favorable recommendation as presented tonight. Um, some of the uh, <coughs> key points within this text amendment is uh, food trucks are allowed on Broadway if they don't use generators. And that's the kicker in this text amendment, that if they do uh, u utilize the public infrastructure and can plug in where they don't use a generator, then they can be allowed there. However, if they do need a generator, they do have to have a generator that's proposed to be 72 decibels or less. And that is about like a standard household vacuum cleaner. The Paducah Planning Commission did express some concerns with some noise for the upper story residents. Uh, staff did some research and we presented that to them at the July 8th meeting and they did adopt that as part of the text amendment which they forwarded to you with the positive recommendation. Okay. So what we talked about yesterday, really the, the, the changes are <clears throat> that we are complying now with the state when they yes. remove the 14 day moving and the fact that if they a food truck locates in front of a restaurant, the restaurant has to approve it. Correct. Those, from what I understood from our meeting yesterday, those are the only changes. The food trucks could already be located <laughs> on Broadway since the food truck ordinance was introduced in 2017. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that part about then the generator is also mm -hmm. new as long as it's under the 72 decibels? Yes, that, that is correct. And it is a recommendation from the Planning Commission. Correct. And also part of this text amendment is the food tents, which we had mentioned. And I wanted to re reiterate a little bit on that, that this stemmed from the uh, convention center needing help from planning with uh, food tents to help alleviate some of the pressure that they've been getting with the food trucks at, at those. You know, I think the good news here is that, uh, you know, after long conversation the residents you know realize the advantage of food trucks and and you know want to coexist so they're not anti-food truck you know they just needed to understand you know better mm -hmm. and I assured them that that uh, you know we wanted a win-win-win here for everybody right. and that we you know that that's what it really had to be you know an interesting positive thing that came out of the discussion was um, you know, and I guess we talked about, uh, you know, the residents getting together and and having their own, like, commission or board or some working group, you know, so that they could, as a group, you know, meet and talk about some of the things that they want to accomplish downtown, you know, and maybe be represented. And I thought that was a great idea. Uh, you know, we need more representation. So uh, I think in the long run, we want more residents downtown. Uh, and um, and so that's that's our goal. So great job this afternoon, though. Thank you, Mayor. I'm I'm always excited about what was going on, and I'm excited about about the food trucks as well. But I think you you're going to know that I'm going to keep asking the same question until we get an answer that 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 that's satisfying, and that is how do we take away the potential of discrimination from one <clears throat> truck, food truck for another. I mean, and maybe, maybe I'm the only one that thinks that that's, a, that that's a concern, but I am interested in that. Sure. Commissioner Henderson, I appreciate that, that question. Uh, staff did take a look at is if we just completely took out that part of the, the zoning ordinance to let food trucks allow to locate anywhere they would like next to a brick and mortar, we would have a lot of brick and mortar restaurants upset at us. So uh, I understand that. So um, there, in staff's opinion, there does need to be some sort of mechanism to allow that if they would like. Um, it goes back to the taco and the hamburger mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm selling pizza over here. Tacos may be okay. Pizza's not. That sort of thing. So when it gets right down to it, to the nitty gritty of that conversation, that really comes down to people, if they are found to be discriminating, for them to report it and for it to be uh, advanced through those avenues. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. But you know, sometimes discrimination 
is hard to prove. Yeah. You just you it just is. know it happened, <laughs> but you can't necessarily prove it all the time. So I'm I'm good. I just and again I want to say I'm not suggesting anything. Right. I'm just looking down the road. I've seen it happen quite often where people have been discriminated against and you can't prove it. They sure. they know that they didn't get a fair shake. And I just want to make sure that everybody who wants to be wherever they want to be can be there without any hassle. Sure. And uh, and I don't know if we could, uh, you know, Bowling Green seems to be our reference place, but I don't know if if we can go to some other cities to see if that's an issue for them or to see how they've handled that issue. But it is a concern for me. Sure. So. And one of the things that we did mention uh, yesterday as well is that the actual radius can be reduced from that 100 feet to perhaps 50 feet. That would open up a lot more opportunity potentially mm -hmm. for food trucks to locate closer to a brick and mortar restaurant mm -hmm. while still giving the brick and mortar restaurant some control over who's their yeah. next door neighbor. Sure. Sure. I'm, I'm good. Commissioner Gulch, you have a concern? No, I was, I was just thinking through. I, I, years ago, there was a similar kind of discussion. Um, it wasn't food trucks, but it was about um, it, peddlers, vendors coming in and selling certain things and, and um, the same pizza taco conversation, mm. but it, it was... <laughs> So you've had the conversation before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically, no, basically, and it, that it was just in a different context. Yeah. And I think the the signature was the only way that they back then came up with the you know everyone mm -hmm. being in agreement. Mm -hmm. Signature, uh, like from the uh, where they have to have uh, permission from the restaurant has to sign. Restaurant, the restaurant has to, to oh, sign. You know that they have to have permission. Mm -hmm. um, that was the same kind of. Like the business owner, if you were going to set up outside, then that business owner had to sign and give sure. permission. It was, that's what was triggering in my head. I don't remember all the details, but it was a similar conversation. I didn't mean to have that look. <laughs> <laughs> are we, are we good to vote? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Um, Thank you, sir. Clerk, would you call roll? Thank you, Josh. Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray. Aye. Thank you all. Mr. Jordan, welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. Thank you. City Clerk, would you read the next uh, the next ordinance? A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt an ordinance entitled an ordinance amending Chapter 46 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Paducah to create Article 5 related to mobile food vehicle inspections. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance creates Article 5 mobile food vehicle inspections of Chapter 46 fire prevention and protection of the Paducah Code of Ordinances for the purpose of implementing a fee of $50 for each mobile food vehicle inspection performed by the Paducah Fire Prevention Division for the City of Paducah mobile food vehicles. Further, this ordinance authorizes and empowers the Paducah Fire Prevention Division to perform inspections for mobile food vehicles which operate outside of city limits but within McCracken County as required by the McCracken County Fiscal Court. Said inspections for McCracken County mobile food vehicles shall be performed at a cost of $50. Said inspection shall be valid for one calendar year from the date of issuance and subsequent renewal inspection shall be at a fee of $50 per inspection. So moved. Second. Okay, this is second reading. Any questions? We beat this one to death. Okay, you can call roll. <laughs> Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, now the famed remote workers incentive program that we've work, been working so hard on. Uh, kudos to uh, Catherine and, and uh, Nick and uh, anybody that's worked on uh, the program, we really appreciate all the hard work that you put into this. So uh, would you go ahead and read that, please? A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to adopt an ordinance entitled An Ordinance Establishing the Remote Workers Incentive Program. This ordinance is summarized as follows. The City of Paducah, Kentucky hereby establishes the City Remote Workers Incentive Program with certain conditions and or requirements in order to be eligible to participate in the City Remote Workers Incentive Program. An applicant employee must be 21 years <coughs> 
uh, old or o older, be a U.S. citizen, lawful permanent resident, or have other credentials necessary to work in the United States, live at least 100 miles outside of the limits of the City of Paducah at the time of application for the remote City Remote Workers Incentive Program, work full-time for a company in which all offices are located at least 100 miles outside the limits of the City of Paducah, be able to perform a majority <coughs> of their employment duties remotely from a home office or co-working space located inside the City of Paducah limits, acquire primary residency in the city of Paducah within three months of acceptance into the program, agree to retain primary residence in the city of Paducah for at least one year beyond the initial 12-month program, and not be a participant in any other publicly funded program initiative. Individuals accepted into the city remote workers incentive program may be eligible to receive up to $2,500 reimbursement for expenses associated with relocating to the city of Paducah, up to $70 per month reimbursement for fees associated with the provision of internet services for a period of 12 months and a waiver of City of Paducah payroll taxes for 12 months. So moved. Second. We ready to get going? Enter the better. Okay. <laughs> Catherine, are there like 30 people lined up ready to go or? I've gotten a lot of emails. <laughs> <laughs> That'll have to do for tonight. Okay. <laughs> All right, City Clerk, call roll. Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye. Okay, with that, we're going to uh, uh, introduce an ordinance tonight. Uh, this is the approval of an interlocal agreement with the county on Barkley Regional Airport Authority. Uh, this is something also we've been working on for a, a very long time, so I'll let the I'll let the city clerk uh, read it and then we'll talk, discuss it. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to introduce an ordinance entitled An Ordinance of the City of Paducah, Kentucky, authorizing and approving an interlocal agreement with the County of McCracken and the Barkley Regional Airport Authority regarding local share payment of the airport terminal project and an estimated amount of $5,800,000 to be funded equally by the City of Paducah and the County of McCracken and authorizing the execution of all documents related to same. This ordinance is summarized as follows. This ordinance authorizes and approves an interlocal cooperation agreement by and between the City of Paducah, Kentucky, the County of McCracken, County, Kentucky, and the Barkley Regional Airport Authority to set forth the portions of the local share of the Barkley Regional Airport Terminal Project, which will be funded by the city, and what portion of the local share of the project will be funded by the county. The local share is estimated to be $5,800,000. In the interlocal cooperation agreement commits the city to provide funding to cover 50% of the local share. A final local share in excess of $6 million is subject to a full review of the Paducah City Commission and the McCracken County Fiscal Court. So move. Second. Okay, so this is this is uh, this is an interlocal agreement. We went straight to an interlocal agreement. We didn't have to go through an MOU or anything of that nature. Uh, the city and county had already agreed uh, that we were going to fund uh, up to three million dollars uh, uh, out of um, our uh, from the city standpoint out of the bond fund, the funds that we have available. Uh, so they went on and drafted, uh, the airport actually drafted this interlocal agreement. And um, I made a, ch a slight change in it, a slight edit in in sort of capping our involvement uh, at, uh, at least initially at $3 million. Uh, it's estimated to be 5.8, so 2.9 each. Uh, but I wanted to just put in there that uh, that if it were over six million dollars and we would have to come back and approve the additional amount uh, just in order to be prudent so that we talked about it so that really was the only substantive change that was made to the original interlocal agreement um, and I think you know from a positive standpoint it's we've been working on this terminal uh, you know for a couple of years now <clears throat> Commissioner Wilson's been very involved I've been very involved. A lot of people in the community have been very involved. Uh, we've been scratching dirt out there. We've uh, we've done the last two sets of bids. Uh, the last bid uh, for the terminal itself uh, came in 30% um, below um, construction estimates. Uh, so that was good news. Um, I always say competition uh, makes the world go round. And so that uh, definitely, I think, made a difference. And so 
Uh, we've got, uh, we're working on to make sure that we get our funding uh, from the FAA for the major portion of it. We're also looking at a, a fundraising opportunity in the community uh, that not only would help close the gap on some funding for the terminal, but also help us um, explore <clears throat> additional air service. Uh, I think one of the one of the things that we hear a lot from the community, you know, is that um, uh, we just go through one, uh, you know, one location, Chicago. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of input. We want southern flights. Uh, we'd like to have a direct flight here, direct flight there. Uh, you know, in a community our size, uh, that's going to require that's going to require uh, an investment from this community, um, most likely to bring a new airline in, and so that's going to have to be funded. And so uh, we're going to be uh, looking at ways to to help us uh, get off the mat. Uh, and and get started with something like that. So um, that's all I got. Uh, it's the first reading. Um, thoughts? Well, I, I was just going to kind of summarize. So we approved 12.5 million tonight of the bond money for the sports complex, which that money was raised for sports. So that's good. This three million, your S <coughs> 2.8 to three million, would also come from the bond money. Correct. And I'm anticipating we're leaving money for 911 in the bond money. Correct, and uh, you know, and then you know the the, the civic center, and, you know that project. And some other projects that, that are on our priorities, but I know we right we're going to set some aside for 911. Right, and you know, in terms of what we've done, you know, I mean, in 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 um, you know, in the first seven months. That we've been here, we've also approved four million dollars for stormwater. Right. Uh, you know, at our last meeting, so uh, got a lot more work to do, but uh, but I think we've been hard at work trying to, you know, trying to spend the money wisely. So. Okay. <laughs> So here we have Chief Laird. Welcome, Brian. Uh, he is going to give us a community policing update. I, um, we've had a lot going on in the community, uh, you know, in the last 60 days from the standpoint of, of uh, things we'd rather not uh, see go on in the community um, relative to some crime and and so I know that uh, Chief Laird, Laird is as concerned as all of us. And so uh, appreciate you being here, Brian. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening again, <clears throat> Mayor Commissioner, City Manager, City Clerk. Um, as the mayor said, over the past couple of months, we've uh, had some violence in our community that uh, unfortunately we're not immune to as, as a lot of places across the country are seeing as well. Uh, but that has caused some concern. Um, with myself, with the mayor, as well as with the, the public. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I want to come here tonight. I um, want to hopefully share some information with you and the members of our community that will provide some clarity uh, and hopefully ease some of those concerns. Um, I've got a brief slideshow that I want to go through and, and kind of show you some statistics that we have both nationally and locally. Um, I want to thank our crime analyst, Michael Zadar, for um, pulling all those numbers as well as crunching the data for us as well. Uh, he's, a, he's an important component to that. So this first slide that we have up here, this is just uh, 20 years worth of violent crime across the entire United States. Uh, so these are stats that are compiled by the, the FBI. Um, as I said, it represents 20 years. You see basically a slow, steady decrease uh, since about the year 2000 with violent crime across the United States. This next one here is the violent crime rate in the city of Paducah. So that starts in the year 2000 and goes to 2020. Uh, as you can see, uh, we've seen a much greater decrease <coughs> over that 20 year period uh, within the city as compared to the national average. So comparatively, we're, we're doing much better than uh, the national average across the United States. Uh, these next couple of slides are gonna take a look at property crime. Uh, which is important to us given uh, the amount of uh, retail establishments that we have and this is uh, what affects most people. Um, so this is the national trend over those uh, last 20 years. 
2020 is not on there because it takes a while for the all the communities across the country to report their crime stats into the FBI, and that's where this information comes from. But you see that slow, steady decrease. Um, and then this is Paducah's crime rate. So you see a pretty good uh, drop <coughs> in that two, four, 2004 to 2007 time frame, and then it stays fairly steady from year to year. Uh, you see a big drop between 2019 and 2020. Um, that was uh, decreased due to the pandemic. But fortunately, what we're seeing right now is our, all of our crime numbers are trending very closely to 2020. The one thing that jumped out for us is, as we reviewed our year-to-date numbers was that uh, so far this year, our burglary reports are down almost 40%. And so what that means is there's less homes and businesses being broken into as compared to uh, previous years. One of the things I wanted to, to mention, I get asked um, quite a bit. I know Commissioner Wilson has asked me about this a few times, and so I wanted to, to kind of highlight this as well. But every year there's different websites and publications that put out information about the safest cities in Kentucky or the safest cities across the United States. And um, a lot of times Paducah doesn't rate very high with those. And I know that the commission gets questions about that. I get questions <coughs> about that as well. Uh, so when, that, when I first started seeing that, we did some research. I did some, our crime analysts did some research on that as well. And what we found is that the way they gather that data is they take the, our crime statistics and they compare that against our population from the census, which is around 25,000. Well, we all know uh, Paducah is a lot bigger than 25,000 people. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce and other organizations all estimate our population to be in the $100,000 or 100,000 range uh, on a daily basis. So when you compare our crime rate against that 100,000 number, the people that are actually in our community every day, our crime rate is very good. And that's one of the main reasons why Paducah continues to be a safe place to live as well as visit. Earlier we looked at some of the basic um, crime graphs and crime trends. So what I want to do now is look at uh, some more uh, in-person, uh, what we call person-based offenses. Uh, these are numbers so far this year. And what we did is we compared them to the last five years. So the numbers on the far right, the ones in the blue, and then the, the single one that's there in the red, uh, show basically how we're doing in 2021, year to date, and that's compared to the five-year average of crime in Paducah. <clears throat> you can see every category shows significant decreases in crime um, across the city, except for one category, which is aggravated assaults. Uh, those uh, aggravated assaults, that category has been trending upward in the last couple of years, and basically what that category is is uh, major felony assaults things like shootings, stabbings, uh, someone being shot at, someone being injured significantly in, some, in a bar fight or, or anything like that. Um, so far this year, we're actually less than, if you look at that number, than we were this time last year uh, in 2020. Our crime analysis uh, also looked <coughs> at similar sized cities in Kentucky, like Hopkinsville and Owensboro and Elizabethtown, um, just to see where, where we're where are we in, uh, as we look at crime in, in the state of Kentucky? Where do we rank in that? And what we found is, is that their numbers are very similar to what ours are. Um, so some are just a little bit better than us and some are a little bit worse than us. Um, the one thing that we know is that guns are directly related to violent crime. And what we did is put together a brief snapshot of what we're seeing when it comes to guns in our community. So these are the number of guns that officers have collected uh, over the past couple of years related to investigations. If you look at those numbers, you'll see in 2018, um, we had a, a pretty good spike there. And what we'll do is take a direct look at uh, the slide that you've seen earlier that showed the historical crime in, in Paducah. And you look at 2018 and you see that little bit of a spike there. And that's a direct correlation to the number of guns that we collected because that's an increase in violent crime. Unfortunately, so far this year, if you look at that number, we've collected more than 60 guns, which puts us on pace to have a significant increase over the past couple of years. Uh, to further demonstrate that correlation between gun crime, between gun and crime, we also looked at the number of arrests that we've made for um, firearm possession by convicted felons. As you can see, um, those numbers also spiked in 2018. So you can see that direct correlation between uh, guns collected violent crime, and felons in possession of firearms. So far this year, we've made 30 arrests. Um, and these, this data is just uh, about a week and a half old, so those numbers may have elevated since then. 
Uh, but we made 30 arrests for felons possessing firearms. Unfortunately, this is something that we see on a regular basis where we have repeat offenders with guns. An example of this occurred over the weekend when we arrested an individual that had, who's a felon, who had a handgun. He had several fully loaded high capacity magazines. Um, we were able to take those on a traffic stop. Our officers doing self-initiated activity and, and was able to recover that. The important thing to note out of that is two weeks prior to that, we arrested that same individual for possession of a firearm by convicted felon in a stolen car. So um, we're, we're spinning our wheels there a little bit. <coughs> Uh, but situations just like this, that's part of the reason why we're starting to see that uptick in violence, not only here in our community, but also in communities across Kentucky and across the United States. I also think it emphasizes the danger that our officers are facing on a daily basis as well. Um, as you can see from the numbers, we're encountering a lot of guns. And I also feel like it's important to note that every one of those, every time that an officer encounters a gun on a traffic stop or on the side of the road, um, those are potential deadly force situations that, that they're encountering on a regular basis. Uh, another question that we get a lot is who's committing the crime in Paducah? Do we have a gang problem? Is it gangs? Um, I think we can all agree that people's behavior has changed over the past couple of years. Uh, the norm as we once knew it when it comes to humanity and how people treat each other seems to be different now than what it was two years ago. So we um, through our crime analysis, as well as, as several large organizations um, that we subscribe to, look at crime, and crime has been studied significantly. Um, one of the things that we see, and that holds true here in Kentucky and here in Paducah as well, is that the number of people, uh, the people that commit crime is a very small number of people within the community. And that's no different here in Paducah. The majority of residents and visitors to our community are law-abiding citizens. And what we don't see are major groups of people committing <coughs> organized crime here in Paducah. That doesn't mean that we don't have people in our community who have affiliations with uh, certain groups or certain gangs um, that ultimately influence their decision. Um, but like I said, we don't see that large uh, gang organizations committing crime here in Paducah. You know, we're continuing our efforts. Uh, the question is, is, what are we doing about it? What are we doing to try to, to stay in front of this? Uh, but we're continuing our community policing efforts because we know that it takes more than just enforcement action and arrests. It takes a community effort to fix community issues. Uh, in June, the mayor, Commissioner Henderson, former city manager Arndt and I met with some of the faith leaders in our community. And the purpose of that meeting was to seek ways to try to curb the violence that we were seeing uh, back in June. Uh, it was a very positive meeting and I was able to share some information with that group. And I think they were very proactive in the every week following that um, going out into the community to areas that we were seeing violence. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I, I th believe that that has made an impact. And one of our long-term projects that we have that starts in just a few days is our school resource officer program. Uh, there wasn't a chance I was going to get away from here today without talking about that. Uh, for the first time ever, when school starts this year in the city of Paducah, we'll have three Paducah police officers in our schools full-time, and that's their sole purpose and their sole job. Um, but the key to that is, is it's not just about the safety and security of our kids. The goal of the program is to build strong relationships between the police and the kids in our community, and also for those officers to serve as positive role models within the community and, and for our kids to see. I did mention enforcement actions and arrests because that is a component of uh, policing and of keeping our community safe. Prior to the beginning of this summer, uh, I reinstituted what we call a flex team. That's a consists of basically two officers that their full-time job is to uh, monitor certain areas and take enforcement action in what we call hot spot areas. We use data to uh, basically drive our areas of enforcement where we're seeing upticks in uh, crime or calls for service. And, and so those folks were, um, that's been their, their main focus for the last few months. Additionally, we've seen an increase in our drug enforcement efforts, uh, resulting in a 50% increase in charges and arrests. And as you can see from the previous slides, uh, those efforts have also led to an increase in gun charges and gun arrests as well. I want to say that it's without question that drugs and drug use uh, have a direct correlation to the crime in our community, and specifically the violent crime. Uh, from thefts and burglaries, sexual offenses, assaults, um, but especially violent crime. 
And one of the other areas that we've focused and worked really hard on is having a good relationship with our federal partners uh, to make sure that we're utilizing all the resources that we have available to us. Uh, and that, you know, we, uh, there was mention earlier about the uh, federal agencies and their building that, that's going up out there. Uh, that's a really good thing for Paducah that provides resources from the FBI, the ATF, uh, and all the other acronyms that come along with the, the federal government. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that overall crime in the city of Puka is down. Uh, we saw a drastic decrease in 2020, mainly what we believe to be due to the pandemic, but I think it's also um, attributed to the policing that we've been doing, to the community effort that uh, this community has done over the past several years. This isn't a uh, one-time fix, a one-year fix. This is uh, a prolonged effort, and though we may have some blips in, the, in what we're seeing right now, uh, I think overall it's important to note that crime is down. Uh, we saw historic level decreases in 2020. Um, we're down 4% below that overall from crime reports so far this year. Uh, so we're hoping that trend continues. Um, we did have, like I said, you know, those uh, violent episodes um, where we had some folks doing some things in the community, and hopefully that's curtailed for now. Um, that's, our, that's our hope anyway. Um, when we compare our numbers to this time in 2019, which was more of a normal year, there's a 20% decrease. Uh, in crime. So I think that's very significant for you guys to know as well as for the, the folks that come and visit our city and live here to know that Paducah is still very safe. And I'll try to entertain any questions that you may have. What do you attribute the 40% uh, decrease in burglaries and what do you attribute that to? Just I, I don't know them? yet. Okay. Um, the, the thing that the pandemic and COVID in general has caused is such an anomaly with uh, crime in general and the statistics because we've never gone through anything where businesses are shut down and uh, folks are staying at home and people mm -hmm. are traveling the roads for the, the period of time that we saw. So um, I don't have a really good answer for that one. Yeah. I wish I could take full credit for it, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. I heard that. So going back to that slide on, on mm -hmm. deaths, uh, was there a slide? I don't know where that was, but go. On deaths? Yeah, or I murders. I, I'm not sure. That one? Murder. Yeah. So in 2021, mur it, it, we've had two two murders. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I thought it was three, I guess. Just two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Have both of those been been solved, or they have been. someone's been arrested? Uh, we have one that's still outstanding. He's wanted. Okay. Yeah, but there's active arrest warrants for him. I, I wanted to ask the school resource officers. You have three for the five city schools. Mm -hmm. Are they rotating among the schools? So one is assigned to Paducah Tillman, one to the middle school, and then one <coughs> rotates between the elementary schools. And does that include, uh, you know, a few years ago we had the uh, concern that I think worked out fine about um, the traffic at the early when they're dropping off at school and at the end, and you would have somebody at the school, like on Park <coughs> Avenue, which is my route, mm -hmm. there in front of McNabb every day. Is, will that continue as well? or We will try to have somebody there every day. When you can. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of that depends on the staffing that we have and um, other calls that are going on at that time. But, you know, we haven't had major issues um, since the school crossing guards um, <clears throat> were right. no longer with us. And the, believe it or not, the signage that we put out, that the schools put out in the roadway on some of the, the non-state maintained roads, um, the one by Clark Elementary does a really good job. People stop for that um, when nobody's in the crosswalk and school's not even in session. So. And, you know, I, I've had a contact you recently. We have people that have talked to me about speeding in neighborhoods and running across stop signs. But I, I mean, I see it everywhere and a lot of places. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you just want us to continue to let you know if we get those, but man, people do drive fast, especially in neighborhoods, well, all over, anywhere they do. And also they just go through the stop signs. They do. And that was, uh, there was actually a, um, a story that came out yesterday or the day before that nationally um, the <coughs> fatality rate is increasing. Um, people are driving faster. Their um, driving skills are decreasing. I don't know what the pandemic 
how that caused that. Um, but that's that's something that we're also seeing on the national level as well. Mm. So to that point, you know, I I I do get uh, some emails from time to time about particular neighborhoods and. You want that feedback uh, sure. so that you can at least put it into a database or you know somehow can track it you know and yeah that's exactly what we do we have a, a database where we track that and then our officers are given that list of areas to extra patrol we also have speed trailer that we pass around into different locations and uh, that list is pretty long of the areas that it goes to um, so it spends <coughs> some time there and what that does is that captures the data for us as well to let us know if there are people speeding because um, it may be one car that comes through there once every two days speeding. Uh, is that a resource? Do we want to devote somebody over there for that one one or two times? But it also tells us the times uh, that folks are coming through there and their speeds as well. So again, we go back to that data-driven policing. We try to be smart and put out the resources and use technology to our benefit. I, s I send myself e emails <clears throat> almost every other day uh, since I'm the commissioner, I just send it to myself. <laughs> but, but there is a problem, you know, uh, even where I live. Not just speeding. 10, 11 o'clock at night, sometimes 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, cars coming through. I mean, speeding, engines revved up, uh, loud music, throwing. I come out just about every morning, and I'm picking up cups and paper and all kinds of stuff out of the yard where folk of food just throw out, thrown out, out of the windows and things. So that is, a, you know, like I said, I haven't gotten any emails from other citizens, but I, I experience it almost every day. Yeah, it's an issue. Let me, let me ask you another question even about the resource officers. Um, I know that we, we've talked about this months ago, but uh, I know that we want the resource officers to be mentors to the kids. So what kind of things will the resource officers be doing to make sure that that mentorship goes on as opposed to just being there to enforce laws and, and perhaps arrest kids? Yeah, that's not the goal at all. Um, we're not going into the schools to arrest kids. Mm -hmm. um, that that's not what we're there for. Well, I know that. I, so, yeah. you know, the, the plan there is, number one, they have to be introduced, and there has to be a level of comfort. Um, and so each individual person that's <clears> going <throat> to those schools, the, the high school will be different than the middle school. The middle school will be different from the grade schools. And so they're looking for those ways to do that, to interact, and they're talking with the principals and the mm -hmm. teachers and trying to figure out the best ways for them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, But the first and most important thing is for them to get in and get comfortable and we're probably not going to see a whole lot of um, extra things out of them for the first several months. Again, this is a brand new program. We're trying to figure it out. Um, we have some guidance from the federal government because this is sponsored through a federal grant, the COPS grant, um, that, that controls some of what we do. Even like truancy and things like that, we are not to be involved in that. Right. Um, so and that's a directive basically from the Department of Justice. So we're looking for those opportunities. Um, they're also going to be attending some training as well, to National School Resource Officer uh, training, to provide them with some of those ideas and look for those best practices on uh, ways to do exactly what you're talking about. And finally, I want to say thank you. I did call you with, also with a major <clears throat> employer that was trying to recruit uh, someone here and had they run against that about the high crime rate and I think you may have even called them back and personally and talked to them to explain it so thank you very much and thanks for everything you guys do. I appreciate that and, and I've, uh, I've argued with those people they've called and asked <laughs> if we wanted to share that on our website and uh, obviously I don't because I, I tell them their math is wrong it, it's bad data um, but unfortunately I, we can't change that because they're just taking the FBI numbers and comparing it to the census. Um, so I wish they would use, if they would Google Paducah and population during the daytime, they would see that it's significantly different. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I just, I want to echo Commissioner Wilson's uh, thanks for all the work that you do. I know that, uh, you know, resources are limited, uh, personnel is limited at times, and I know you'd like to have more people to get done, but I think you do a great job with the you know, with the staff that you have. And, and also I want to give you a special thanks for helping out with, uh, you know, our what's going on out on I-24. Uh, Chief Laird uh, participated in our I-24 meeting. You know, we got some 
uh, tough stuff going on out there, you know, with uh, some deaths and trying to figure out what to do. So appreciate your input on that as well. And we made some progress on that, um, getting them to, to lower the speed limit down. We sure did. There as well. So I'm hoping that tomorrow's meeting that they have will uh, also do some, take some other efforts to extend that work zone. And um, <clears throat> if, if we slow people down uh, leading into that, leading up to, to the area where the collisions are happening, uh, I really believe that that will, if there is a collision, it will definitely mitigate uh, the damage that's done by a vehicle that's going a lot slower. It's been a good team effort so far, so thanks, thanks for your help. You know, and uh, you know, you you've complimented me, but uh, there's no way that I could do what's done here without the the staff of the police department, the 911 center. Um, <clears throat> they're the ones that are out there every day, uh, pulling those guns off the street, uh, talking with the kids on the side of the road, and um, you know, they're doing that working overtime because we are short. Um, again, I couldn't get out without that plug either. Um, <laughs> it, it's not that, um, that I'm asking for more people. I'm just trying to fill the, the spots that we have. Um, yeah. But a lot of that's just because of, of the academy being shut down for a period of time. Uh, we're making significant progress with that, um, but it is challenging uh, when you're working with yes. you know, about 10 or 12 fewer people. Well, please pass along our thanks to your team. I will. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, city manager, any comments? Are you wide-eyed? Oh yeah, most definitely. Uh, just would like to take the opportunity to, uh, to to express my appreciation and Trish's appreciation for the confidence in uh, allowing us to become part of the team. Uh, we're excited to, to be part of the community, uh, still looking for housing uh, and, and going through that. So so I don't know if one of those cottage houses might might fit the bill or not. But, uh, you know, the, the community has been welcoming, you know, last week, you may or we were talking about and got asked, uh, we were in a meeting and somebody asked if about the fire hose and I said, no, it's, it's the fire hydrant, but it, we've taken it down a notch a little bit, but the team's been great. Uh, I can't say enough uh, about, uh, you know, the team that, that, and you all know this, the team that you had here in place, uh, you know, top notch. Um, and uh, they've, they've shown that, been very <laughs> welcoming, uh, been very helpful. Um, kudos to Michelle, who's been uh, guiding me around and, and getting me uh, to where I needed to go and keeping me on task at, at times when I, I want to talk a little bit more than I should. But uh, it's, it's been great and it's exciting. And, you know, uh, I'm sure I'll hear from Chief tonight. Uh, we're going to go out at 10 o'clock to start meeting uh, some of that department uh, this evening. I'm sure I'll hear about the, the staffing uh, level again. But uh, we're, we're doing that and it's, it's an exciting time to be part of Paducah. Uh, this morning, I got to meet uh, at Etcetera Cafe with Commissioner Henderson and, and a group of, uh, of gentlemen. I won't, <laughs> it was, but it was good. I, that's what I enjoy. I enjoy getting out and meeting in the community and meeting our team. And, and so we've, we've been doing a lot of that this first week and a half and looking forward to it. And uh, Commissioner, you were, you were talking about the numbers and the amounts of funds that this, this commission has allocated for projects, but it's exciting part to be a part of the community when you think about the other private projects that are going on and the building and stuff. I mean, we were talking a couple weeks ago, what, close to a million dollars in private investment and in projects that are ongoing with, with everything, you know, along the lines. And so it's exciting time to be uh, Paducah and I'm glad to be part of it. Great, thank you so much. We are awfully glad to have you, so welcome. Uh, any other comments from any other commissioners? Okay, uh, then I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. A proposed motion of the Board of Commissioners to go into closed session for discussion of matters pertaining to the following topics, issues which might lead to the appointment, dismissal, or disciplining of an employee as permitted by KRS 618101F, a specific proposal by a business entity where public discussion of the subject matter would jeopardize the location, retention, expansion, or upgrading of a business entity as permitted by KRS 618101G. So moved. Second. Commissioner Galt? Aye. Commissioner Henderson? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Mayor Bray? Aye.